And uh, also, uh, I guess the, uh, in the, uh, the next speaker in general can come up and make sure their presentation is ready to go like while, during the question period, since we're running a little behind. So sorry again that we're running behind, but we'll give everybody their full amount of time. So the next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Sherrington on a spin glass theorist's perspective on displacive relaxer ferroelectrics. It, the, the clicker should work. Okay, Does this I've never, never tried it on this. Um, it should work, right? Is there not a way to oh, wait, put wait, wait, wait. The slide? Does this slide thing, uh, Michael, is this supposed to work? Uh, okay. uh, well, is, is, it, is it showing the whole slide or not? It's showing actually stuff. Or is it this one? <laughs> yeah, what? Uh, on, on my machine, there'd always be something at the top which would say slideshow, and you can say, but then yeah, never yeah. mind, I'll, I'll okay. do it. Okay. Do okay, there is a mic over there, or you can walk around with this. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Um, as you can see there, I, I've added an extra word, retired, in there, uh, and that's deliberate because... Uh, I really got interested in this subject after I retired 11 years ago. I've been interested in spin glasses all, for, for many, many years. Um, and so this means being retired that I have no grant, I have no students, I have no postdocs. I'm responsible and I haven't read all of the literature, so I apologize in advance for my lack of knowledge. However, I'd like to give you a slightly different perspective than the one that perhaps you usually get. Except that, I, oh dear. Um, oh, sorry. Test? Yeah, yeah. yeah the and then you can advance by just pressing this button there. Okay. Let's hope I can. Okay. Yeah, so my uh, plan is to argue that displacive relaxers are conceptually similar to induced moment soft pseudo spin glasses. I'll explain that later. Uh, I think there's something about random scale fields that's missing on the bottom because of the extra line there. But I'll do so using analogies, uh, both for materials and also minimal modeling. There's been a lot of modeling done in, the, in your subject, but I have the impression that a large part of it is modeling for reality to represent the experimental situations. Uh, the systems are complicated. And it's been the case in spin glasses that by looking at simple models to try to find what we think are the important features has been productive. So, uh, I'm going, it would be good if we could possibly have this thing to uh, align. You can talk and I'll try to. Okay, anyway, I'm going to take as my uh, object the, the, the well known ABO3 perovskite type of structure. I thought I'd be easier we're using a, a PDF rather than PD, uh, P, uh, PowerPoint because I did it on a Macintosh and it will often what else, but maybe that wasn't good. Anyway, I would like to argue that uh, there is, firstly, to, let's discuss some correspondences between magnetic and dielectric systems, which is on the next slide if we can ever get it. Uh, hold that. Okay, so firstly, there are these two kinds of transitions that we talk about. Order disorder transitions, the analogs are ferro, local moment ferromagnetism and preformed electric dipole ferroelectricity. Cooperatively induced moments, you have the displacing ferroelectricity, which is what we're talking about today. The analog in magnetism is itinerant magnetism. And it isn't working. Um, yeah. There should be a slide thing, yeah, but I can't find it. I know how to find it on my own computer. This is a IE. Okay, anyway, um, when we come to the disordered problems, we, we both relaxers and spring glasses are substitutional alloys. 
In the case of the conventional spring glasses, they have preformed local moments, uh, but there is an extension to uh, uh, induced moment systems called itinerant magnets. And in the corresponding relaxes one, we've got the things I just talked about before. But what do you see with them? Well, how, how similar are they that would set me starting to look at this? Look at the susceptibility peaks, if only we could, which, um, when it eventually comes up, the susceptibility peaks look very, very similar, frequency-dependent susceptibilities in, uh, in, in relaxes like PMN, which are heterovalent, in uh, relaxes like BZT, which are homovalent, and in spin glasses. Can and you fix this? It'll take us 10 seconds. Okay. Okay. I got it. So I was trying to avoid the situation where if you play a PowerPoint on a different computer, it will scramble it all up. That's why I brought my old computer, but... <laughs> Just give us a second. <laughs> what was that, PDF file? Or yeah, it's a PDF file. It's open in a browser rather than... But it's, but it's, it's a PDF file. Uh, on, certainly on preview, and I would have trusted on that. Uh, yeah, on, I don't, don't we don't have a, a slide show. I, 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 I have a PDF. It's easy to do, well, my machine has never known it to be difficult. However, it's probably a, a relaxer example of these things, rather than a good Hold the microphone closer to you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Right. So those are the things that look very similar. You don't need to take anything further away except for the fact that they're three different systems, they all look very similar, and they're all clearly glassy, number one. And then uh, we also know that the, uh, the displacements in spin glasses and, and, uh, have moments which are collectively frozen in a quasi-random fashion. You can tell it for, in spin glasses by measuring, for example, a MOSBAR hyperfine splitting to tell you that there's a frozen local moment, and neutron diffraction to tell you that it isn't periodic. And of course, you believe there are similar things here. If we look at the global magnetization in a spin glass, there is no global magnetization, and as we know for real axis, there's no change in the average global structure. There's a phase transition, certainly in the spin glasses. Whether there is in the relaxers is a question. One of the ways that that was demonstrated in the spin glass thing, and the, what really set the interest in spin glasses going, were these experiments by Canella and Maidosh in 1972, where they found that if you looked at the susceptibility in a field, it was rounded. But if you reduced the field and you killed the Earth, you countered the Earth's own field, then that thing became sharp. The earlier experiments, the squares there, uh, were ones which were done without this. But the sharp cusp suggests there's a true phase transition in the zero field limit. But note, it's, di it's sharp, it's not divergent. So that already tells you that magnetization is not the relevant order parameter, and you shouldn't expect an ordinary mo uh, normal mode to go soft there, one which is described by a wave vector. The sharpness is also just demonstrated in some sophisticated models, which I may have time to talk about or not, I don't know now. But one of my questions in the relaxers, can you go to a very, very small measuring field in order to see whether that rounding sharpens up or not? And I've not seen anything on that, but no doubt it exists. Another thing you can compare are uh, field cooled and zero field cooled susceptibilities. So what we've got going from left to right is a, a copper manganese spin glass, it's a local moment spin glass, a simulation on a homovalent uh, uh, relaxer BZT, an experiment on PMN, and a cluster glass. And what they all show is a separation at some temperature between field-cooled uh, uh, field and zero-field-cooled results here, telling you that there is some non-ergodicity beneath that transition, a separation of FC and ZFC, uh, uh, suggesting a new phase beneath TG, although whether it's a true phase or a continuous thing, uh, you can argue, uh, well, we, we have argued for the spin glasses. 
still. Sorry, I'm kind of uh, got a large, large internal noise level at the moment after the beginning. The physical explanation that you do for a spin glass, and I think it's much the same for a relaxer, is that in the low temperature phase, the, the, the phase that you get is obviously the one that minimizes the free energy. It's cooperatively ordered, but it's not periodic. The free energy surface, and as we know in spin glasses, is, is very rough. That's a surface in some uh, high dimensional uh, space describing all the microscopic behavior. There are many energy barriers, many, many minima separate, oh, excuse me, separated separated by, uh, by valleys and that if you were going to try to look at one of these things by uh, cooling with no field on you may end up whatever was the best for, for that situation say here but when you uh, then put the field on the whole of the landscape can change and it can be over here but you wouldn't get to it if you cool without the field on if you cool with the field on you'll always tend to go towards the true local one at that thing, that point. So I think that's probably going on in your relaxers as well. Um, one of the other things we've been hearing about are polar nano regions, analogs being clusters in cluster glasses, and I'll return to that later. So what are the fundamental ingredients? Well, for spin glasses, it's a combination of frustrated interactions, so ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic, or even antiferromagnetic alone, uh, where you can't satisfy all of those instructions, together with quench disorder, which says there isn't a simple way to deal with it. If you have frustration alone, then you can always take the best periodic com uh, uh, compromise. But if you have disorder as well, different pieces are different from, uh, different, uh, from other ones because of the randomness, because of the disorder. And the quench disorder disrupts this, and the best compromise in many of these spin glasses is something which is quasi-random and glassy. And I think I, one would expect the same thing for a relaxer. Uh, but then, of course, there are these two different kinds of react, re, relaxers, the uh, homovalent ones, such as we've, uh, BZT, or heterovalent ones, which we've just been hearing about. Let's now go to a bit of modeling to try to understand this. And I say minimal modeling. I don't want everything in. I just want to look at some simple bits which might help me to understand what's going on. In the, oh, sorry, that's not the one I want. Um, I usually can't see these. Um, so this is a standard local moment magnetism type of Hamiltonian with some sort of disorder. Well, first of all, we do the periodic case. The second one is a, mo a simple model version of the things that uh, much more eminent theorists in this subject than I, sitting in the audience among them, uh, have, have looked at with many different sorts of terms where you expand in terms of the displacements away from the kind of uh, periodic structure of, uh, of the uh, perovskite with a, a, local, a local displacement term which tells you how much it costs to move an iron and then an interaction which says how much you can gain. Now, uh, so this is usually called K2, the one that's called, I thought it was K here. It, it, you, I imagine you do that for all the atoms, but if you want the way it's actually done usually, it's like in terms of normal modes from uh, the pure material. If, K, if, if this quantity K, which I can't get to press, um, is negative, then it tells you that there will be local displacement even without these interaction terms. The system would like to displace. If on the other hand it's positive, then that first term alone would say that you don't want to displace uh, unless you do something else. But if you now add the extra, en extra gain in uh, binding energy, which, which allows for displacement everywhere, then you can find a uniform cooperative phase, a, a, a lower energy, and that's your ferroelectric, or something like that. So it's the reason why BT is ferroelectric and BZ is not in this simple picture, is that KTI is small enough for, 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 for titanium, but it's too large for, for zirconium for the moment to come. Uh, the analogous situation for uh, an itinerant ferromagnet, uh, I, I, you can see this in terms of Hubbard model, this was done long ago, but basically what the first condition is the analog of the one for a local moment, and the second one, an isolated local moment, the Anderson condition, and the second one is the Stoner condition for, ferro, uh, for ferromagnetism. So, now suppose that we 
Uh, we talk about adding disorder. In the case of the magnetic problems, it's usually that you sum over only a substitution of okay. magnetic and non-magnetic atoms. You sum over only the magnetic sites. Uh, uh, and the interaction JIJ itself has got both positive and negative terms in it, and that can be enough to uh, give you a new phase. In the case of the displacive relaxer, the corresponding thing is very similar, uh, except that now we have, if we've got a substitution alloy, you can think that you've got two different values of K, for example, for titanium zirconium uh, in, in BZT, and, uh, and, and by the same argument I used earlier, you, you can see that if that one is, if this combination is negative, you have a sort of active ion, something that can, uh, can displace easily, if it's positive, on the other hand, it's essentially non-active. That's the zirconium in this case. Or in the magnetic example, it's so bad that it isn't magnetic at all, gold. So sufficient disorder plus frustration, then the quasi-random cooperation may be low, the lowest one, rather than a periodic system. That would be my spin glass or relaxer. So what would you expect? So that would tell you that uh, you, what you'd expect to get is a phase diagram like the thing that I've got at the top, which is not unlike one that's been measured sometime. But if you want to compare it with some other real, uh, phase transitions that have been uh, around in, in spin glasses, say, this is an old uh, one with a ferromagnet, paramagnet, and some sort of spin glass down there. But that was for local moments. We haven't got local moments. You've got to pay, you've got to gain more to get over that initial um, uh, penalty, the quadratic penalty. So it's as though you draw a line along here, where this is the, essentially the energy locally, the magnitude of the energy locally, and the guy cut the lower part of the diagram off. This is a similar thing, much more recently done for some simulations on a, a site diluted dipolarizing simulation. There's an anti it's an anti ferromagnet and a spin glass that goes all the way down there. If this, these were not local moments, but were uh, uh, displacing things, you, you cut the bottom off. And this is what you actually get for, uh, for rhodium cobalt. Rhodium cobalt is a, a, a metallic alloy uh, where the, the isolated cobalts don't carry a moment, but if you put enough of them, then you can get a moment, and the moment will give you a ferromagnet, a glass, and a paramagnet. So that would, in my view, sort of go some way to explain how you could get such a behavior in, in a, a, a home valent relaxer. What about the PNRs that we keep hearing a huge amount about? Well, we've already been told, if you've got random site occupation, I'm not going to talk about when it gets periodically uh, chemically ordered. So you've got statistical chemical clustering, such as we've just heard about, a cluster with sufficient internal cooperative ordering to overcome the local displacement costs will give you a cluster. It may or may not be polar. It depends upon which ones are there, but perhaps usually it is. Uh, if it's a, a homovalent system, then the onset of that is going to be roughly the same as the temperature of the pure system uh, to, uh, to order as a ferroelectric as the Burns temperature. And then eventually you'll get, P P the, these, these PNRs will be separated, but eventually they will, um, they will link up. So the PNRs will, will percolate as opposed to the chemicals will percolating. Uh, and uh, then you get the relaxer phase. The feasibility, of course, of PNRs depends on their lifetimes relative to the probe measurement time, which is why I think you see them much more in ferroelectrics than you do in magnetic systems. Uh, no. Unfortunately, the, the slide that I thought I'd put in here isn't here. So uh, you can also see it in terms of uh, the eigenvalues of a, a random matrix. Now, what about BZT and PZT? Well, BZT is a relaxer, PZT is not. Why, I ask myself. So I apologize that you know all the answers to these things, but I'm describing you how uh, an ignorant spin glass theorist uh, looks at it. Uh, and I've noted that uh, uh, it, the BZT is a relaxer, PZT is not. So why? And uh, the, the answer you, you can see if you uh, look at the relative displacement as Professor Vanderbilt's calculations on that it's four t the, the titanium displaces four times more than barium in barium titanate, but in lead titanate it's the other way around. 
So therefore, I, I find myself thinking it's, it's really the consequence of the relative cost of the local displacement, is the K, the kappas, as I'm sure you know already. And then I don't have access to calculate, or you can calculate those, you know, by all sorts of fancy uh, electronic structure and such like calculations. I don't have access to that, so I look them up in, in Wikipedia at the ionic radii and see, compare those, and what I note is that in, uh, in titanium, the, uh, the, the ionic radius is much smaller than that in zirconium. That tells me it's harder to move zirconium than it is to move titanium, which is roughly in agreement with BZ and BT. Uh, for the leads, uh, lead and barium, similarly, lead has got a much smaller one than, uh, smaller ionic radius than barium. So with these very naive arguments, uh, I can see why I would expect to get these kinds of rules. Uh, but then, if I then go, sorry, have I got any time? Um, <coughs> go back to PNN, MN, and uh, uh, try and ask about the random fields. How important are they? Uh, well, I come to the conclusion that they are important. Um, whoops, sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button. Um, compared with barium titan uh, lead titanate, then uh, you've got these extra charges as we've just been talked about. Uh, talked about. So the B-side occupation will therefore give effective random fields, particularly effective on the uh, uh, acting on the, on the lead. But it'll also affect the, the values of K on the barium sites. Uh, now, if we look at those, we see that magnesium ionic radius is about the same as zirconium, so it's presumably equally ineffective. The niobium, on the other hand, is much closer to titanium size, so it's probably active, and, uh, but less, uh, probably less than titanium. So I would then say that PMN, in some sense, can be thought of as being like PZT plus random fields and some, some extra random interactions involving B sites. But already that suggests to me, uh, to my surprise, but to, uh, the, uh, uh, to the understanding of many people in your field for years, uh, for P uh, random fields play an essential role in the relaxer for PMN. But not for BZT, I don't believe. What about some simulations? Well, uh, the... Uh, the the Arkansas group has been looking at these, and uh, I was thinking that they, they were you know, looking at the PNNs, the PV centered and the virtual crystals on the, on the B sites plus the random fields. Um, well, I believe they do do that. If they exclude the random fields, they find a ferroelectric. Good. But if you include the fields, they find this rounded, uh, uh, re relaxer like peak. Um, and that then is the suggestion, not made by me, but made by them, that this is, a, this is the relaxer. But it's not very sharp. Should it be sharp? I go back to the questions I was asking before about how sharp can these things be? Can one look at it by size scaling? This is what one does to, to find out whether these things are sharp in simulations in spin glasses. You look on a simple model system at many different sizes, and then you try and scale, size scale and go towards the limit of infinite size. Uh, um, I thought I had some things there. But what about elsewhere? Well, I'm comparing magnetic and, and ferroelectric types of systems, but in magnetic systems, there is no obvious way, or maybe there is no way, to create random fields inside the magnets. What people do sometimes instead is to say, well, we look at a random antiferromagnet, nearest neighbor antiferromagnet, in uniform field. But then that is, uh, first of all, only for short range systems. And secondly, it's uh, tied to, uh, uh, to, to the underlying lattice structure, the, uh, by, by, what do you call it, binary lattice. But another intriguing thing for me, uh, as a spin glass physicist, is that it's generally believed in the spin glass community that external fields are anathema to sharp spin glass transitions. Quite the opposite, so, so saying there shouldn't be a sharp transition there. There is an exception, it happens in a model that I invented, and which everybody agrees is true, but that is the exception. But it is exceptional in, in, in one curious way, it's got infinite range interactions. There'll be a randomly chosen infinite range interactions. And of course, in ferroelectrics, you have very long range Coulomb interactions. And whether that's relevant or not, I don't know. 
But then another system which comes from, uh, from condensed matter physics, which uh, people in the Cisco mechanics community have been looking at as well, are the, what's called the Coulomb glass. These are some systems of strongly doped insulators with interacting in electrons uh, and random, random potential. So there's randomness in the local energies uh, of the electronic sites, but they interact with Coulomb interactions then, unscreen Coulomb interactions. Uh, these, these were discovered quite a number of years ago, 30 odd years ago, uh, by Pollock and company. But you can map those things, oops, into, uh, if, if it's a half filled system, you can map it into a Coulombic interaction using anti ferromagnetic system plus random fields. So the Hamiltonian has no minus sign in front of it, that's why it's anti ferromagnetic. And it can't obviously satisfy everything, because uh, you can't have. Uh, tri a triangle of antimagnetic things is always frustrated. The way that this has been looked at very recently in a paper that came out, I was going to say this year, but I mean December last year. Um, and they do it, this is a way that you can try to look for a transition in one of these, uh, these systems by size scale. These are looking at some quantity, uh, it's actually a correlation length divided by the length uh, uh, at different, uh, uh, for different sizes. If this was going to go to a, a, an infinite limit, you'd expect it to go to a top hat, uh, to a, a sharp step there. They all go through the same point, and that's the signal that there is a phase transition. In other, there are other systems where if you had a uniform field on, uh, you wouldn't have a phase transition, then the lines don't cross that way. But these authors, uh, the, the ones I've mentioned here, have argued that there is a phase transition by looking at a rather subtle quantity, some are called four replica con, uh, correlations, and argue that there is a phase transition to a Coulomb gas in this system, which then comes back to me asking, you know, could that be the case in, uh, in some other a system with other frustrated interactions, maybe like PMN. On the other hand, there, there is some concern as to whether this, these, calc these simulations are really good enough. And I find it quite puzzling that the, uh, the transition temperature in the Coulomb glass here seems more or less independent of how strong the potential is, which seems sort of counterintuitive. But anyway, there are various questions that one can ask. This is just again to show you a few different figures of, in PMN of, uh, of Akshayev's uh, uh, of the, uh, the distribution of, of deviations of, of, uh, of the lead atoms compared with what you get in some Coulomb gas thing for the local field distribution, or for that matter, in this SK model, the Schengen Karmenic model. Uh, but anyway, I, I don't, I'm not pretending to try to assault any of these things, um, but I've come to conclude, and would like to have some tentative conclusions, that relaxers are, are somewhat like spin glasses, somewhat like uh, stra Coulomb glasses. Strain glasses are another example in Martin Sittick alloys. Uh, but in all of them, the, the important ingredients, I believe, are frustrated interactions and quench disorder. Certainly, quench disorder with just sight or bond disorder, but no extra charges, uh, surely can work. That's uh, the, the usual spin glasses and uh, homovalent relaxers. But then there seems to be a possibility that also with some other thing like the random fields acting as the, uh, the random forces breaking up the ability for the, for the regular interactions to form a periodic structure uh, might be uh, what lies be, be, be behind PMN. But, uh, uh, and as I say, the pseudospins can be either inherent or, or induced displacement. But I think what I'm trying to say is that not, not, is not to, uh, to, to say that I have any solutions for you, uh, but rather to say that I think that there's a role to play in simple models. So I would like, for example, to persuade my colleagues who looked at this thing to look at it with some other interactions here uh, the, for the, the, the interaction part, uh, also probably long range and frustrated, and see whether this feature uh, continues there. And I'd like you to try and think about whether you can see whether those transitions are sharp enough by whatever means it takes you as an experimentalist to, to reduce the, uh, the amount, the strength of your measuring fields, and as a theorist to, to go through the different size scaling. But uh, I, I don't think you, uh, to answer those questions, you have to put in absolutely everything in absolutely the, the right experimental uh, 
values uh, in order to try to, uh, to get some knowledge as to whether it's, uh, it exists or not. Thank you. Okay, great. So we have time for some questions. Yeah. So, so uh, I just wanted to ask about the uh, relationship between the the spatial disorder and the and the frequency uh, dispersion. You know, like uh, the rela in other words, like the time part of the relaxer effect versus the the uh, kind of frozen in uh, disorder. Well, that, that obviously requires something uh, which involves time dependence and uh, the rate at which things move, and I haven't uh, done any of that, but uh, it seems to me f natural that, uh, that atoms move more slowly than spins. So uh, that's why I say that I would expect it to, and, but uh, you know, you, you, you already know, I think, from experiments that depends on what kind of probe you've got, you know, as, as, as to how much, to what extent you can see it. Well, that matters, uh, just, just one other thing, since we, uh, the last talk mentioned about snapshots, and uh, I know that also in some of the simulations I've seen, you look at these snapshots of PNRs, but part of the important thing for my feeling is to see whether these, those PNRs are persistent, and not just to look at a single snapshot, but to look and see wh how persistent they are, look, uh, correlate in time. Uh, for that's that's was the initial thing in the, in the spin glasses was saying the other parameter it's not just where they are it's it's how much they relax are they frozen or are they not frozen, uh, um, but that, 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 but what precisely those time scales are I don't know a priori. Uh, time for more questions. Um, David, you mentioned uh, very quickly the strain glass people, yeah. and I tried to read some of the literature, and my starts, head started to fume. Uh, the, the, the emphasis on the frustration is very little there. I mean, they just change the chemical composition and then add the disorder, but they, I, I haven't seen that there's a, a term like in your Hamiltonian which has anything to do with the real local frustration. Do, do you think? When you change the shape of one of these cells, uh, uh, and, and taking account of how the strain field uh, at one point affects the strain field at another point, there's something called the San Bernard. Yeah, but that yeah sure, but that kind of anti yeah, but that's non-local. Yeah, but it's a non-local interaction. I mean, it's really very large distances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always a Coulomb. Yeah, I mean, I, it's always a Coulomb potential. That's what is doing it here. Mm. In, in, Magnetic spin glasses, mm. the KKY potential, which, which is a one over R field. Mm. So I think there are long range of potential. To what extent they have to be so long range, I do not know. Mm. I feel pretty sure that they do need to be frustrated that there's some competition between the interactions at one red length uh, scale or this angle and at another, and that you can't satisfy all of them simultaneously. I can't optimize all of them simultaneously. Mm. One more uh, question. I was curious for the simulations you showed, especially with long range interactions, are they using some sort of physically inspired local move or is there more of an artificial long distance or non-local move in order to make the convergence reasonable? Because it seems like a very hard problem to simulate in the low temperature phase. counter-arguments of things like uh, self-gravitating, uh, things, you know, in, in astrophysics where you have to be worried about uh, how, to what extent uh, uh, um, the ordinary statistical mechanics applies to these things. Um, and I think that also in those particular systems, because the number of electrons is actually fixed, you, you should really have uh, Kawasaki type of moves, you know, so that you maintain the, the, the balance between the up and down spins. Which doesn't exist, of course, in the, in, in the uh, I don't think it does, in, in the relaxers, because they just displace them. They don't have any uh, conservation. Constraint. But the, the, the top and bottom of answering is, is I, I've, I've just read the papers 
And uh, I have talked to uh, one of my other friends who does all these things, and he reckons he doesn't understand or he doesn't believe it. So it may be rubbish, uh, but, and, and as I said, the fact that it doesn't depend on the magnitude of, of W very significantly. It makes me suspicious, but, 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 but what I feel pretty confident about is that there, is a, there must be, in things like PNN, a competition between the random fields and the, uh, and the, the, the frustrated long-range uh, Coulomb interactions. But precisely how it plays, I, I don't know. But I think that, you know, you've got a better chance to answer it with some simple models where you don't have too many variables. Okay, well, thank you very much.